Moby. Producer, singer, multi-instrumentalist, also dated Lana Del Rey and Natalie Portman once or twice. Don't ever forget it! But before he was clinging on to past celebrity hookups a little too much, Moby was a prominent name in electronic music throughout much of the 1990s and the early 2000s, alternating between catering to ravers and insomniacs. Richard Belville Hall went through various pseudonyms before settling on Moby, after which he broke through in 1991 with the single Go, with the combination of pulsing four on the floor drums, soulful vocal samples, and syncopated keyboard stabs that many would generically refer to as techno in the 90s. Go was a top 10 UK hit, but the self titled debut album that followed, with more hard edged synths and less of the chill vibes created by the Twin Peaks string sample on Go, didn't really catch on. After releasing a low-key follow-up album of ambient techno cleverly titled, um, ambient, Moby's third album, 1995's Everything Is Wrong, continued in the more trancey vein of Go, but he showed that he wasn't afraid to branch out into multiple other styles. <laughs> While not a blockbuster, Everything Is Wrong was pretty well received, with numerous publications praising the album at the time. However, Moby's manager recalls his client feeling that many critics weren't taking his work seriously enough and dismissing it. So what do you do, as an electronic artist, when you feel like you need to gain more respect from reviewers? Well, Moby's answer to that question on 1996's Animal Rights was... Make a punk rock album? Unsurprisingly, it flopped pretty badly. He didn't endear himself too much to fans of Seattle heavyweight Soundgarden when he promoted the album as their opening act, and his standalone tours didn't fare much better, having confused and or alienated much of his electro-oriented audience. Now it's not like this sudden shift to guitar-dominated music came out of nowhere. His first band, Vatican Commandos, was a hardcore punk group. Five, and he had only really started to develop an interest in electronic music as a young adult when he felt limited by the use of guitars. So Animal Rice was basically Moby swinging back in the other direction. But exactly how well did he pull it off? That's the question I hope to answer in a series, or potential series at least, called Can They Rock? A look at rock albums made by artists who, at that point in their careers, weren't exactly known for making rock and or roll. Perhaps one of the main reasons that Animal Rights bombed is that it was generally treated as a punk rock album, but on listening to it, it doesn't really come off that way to me. Punk influence, sure, but not really punk in itself. The meaty guitars feel more in line with grunge and old school heavy metal. If there's one band from punk circles that I compare the album to, it'd be San Francisco band Flipper, who Moby claims to have briefly sung for at two live shows when he was 16. Not that they'd be able to remember it though, but their music was sludgy and grinding, so not your typical punk band, and certainly not hardcore punk. Meanwhile, the way he mixed his vocals throughout the album makes it sound like he was singing into an intercom while standing in an echo chamber, or something along those murky lines. A true punk would own their voice, even if they sound like shit. He also doesn't have a particularly powerful voice, and power is probably the most important attribute for a punk vocalist. So his voice is definitely more suited for down-tempo, trip-hop kind of stuff than the confused punk metal hybrid of Animal Rights. The other big detrimental thing in this album's sound is the drums, which I'm pretty certain are all electronic, though the album credits state that Moby played the drums himself. So I take it he was playing one of those electronic drum kits. Some of the songs, like the singles That's When I Reach For My Revolver and Come On Baby, sound like he was embracing the electronic sound of the drums. But on most songs, it sounds like he was just using them in place of a live drum kit. And in both cases, these drums are goddamn weak. When the songs get faster, they're less like slamming hardcore and more like Diet Nine Inch Nails, a band that the album's co-producer Alan Mulder had already worked with at that point. Maybe he should have given Moby a few more pointers. Nine Inch Nails ripoff would still be an upgrade from Diet Nine Inch Nails, wouldn't it? And what makes this album even more bewildering to look back on is that Moby didn't even fully commit himself one way or the other. Not only does the album have three calm instrumental songs featuring clean guitar and a violin on two of them even, but the original album was distributed with a bonus disc of ambient music, then five months later the album was re-released with a new track list, mixing some of those ambient tracks and some bonus ones in with the original track list. And it just doesn't make any sense to go from this... To this. 
or if you're Robert Christgau, it apparently makes every bit of sense. Because of that, Animal Rights is most likely the only album on Wikipedia with a combination of hardcore punk and ambient in its genre tags. If someone can find another album with a Wikipedia page that lists both of those styles and definitely fits those descriptions, I will be hugely impressed. But instead of growing his fan base to include more alt-rock oriented people, along with his original techno head fans, he largely just distanced himself from both of them. Actually, pissing everyone off equally is possibly the ultimate punk move, isn't it? Moby's pick of That's When I Reached My Revolver as the album's main single was also a fairly punkish choice in that it's a cover of the signature 1981 song by American post-punk group Mission of Burma. And as someone who highly recommends early Mission of Burma, I must say that Moby's version is decent enough. Even with the electro drums sounding particularly tacky on this one, it's still pretty respectable compared to the original. What was less respectable was Moby caving into MTV's request for censorship and re-recording the vocals in the chorus singing That's when I realize it's over. Firstly, changing song lyrics for airplay on TV is one of the most unpunk things you can possibly do. Secondly, it feels like a bit of a dick move to do that to someone else's song. Putting that aside, Moby's take on Revolver certainly doesn't beat the original, but it's pretty far from a butchering of it. If you really want a bad Moby cover from the Animal Rights era, then there's his cover of Devo's Whip It, with the wildly inaccurate subtitle of Death Metal Version. This is what a Death Metal Devo cover might sound like. This is just... crap. But the songs that actually made it onto Animal Rights thankfully don't reach that level of cringe. And there's certainly some much nicer things that I can say about this album than just that. For one, Moby can play the fuck out of a guitar. There are some decent little solos on here, and even if some of the songs might be a bit lame, he at least didn't play them sloppily. The songs that are potentially the lamest for me are all in the first half of the album. Come On Baby is one of those oh-so 90s blends of big guitar riffs and a funky dance beat. Then from Someone to Love to My Love Will Never Die, you get the most hard and fast songs on the album. But even though those songs clearly do not play to Moby's strengths, I still find them weirdly enjoyable. What played more to his strengths were the slower songs in the second half of the album, particularly Say It's All Mine and Face It. One might expect tracks that are 6 minutes and 10 minutes long respectively to be painful to listen to on an album like this, but these are actually my favourite songs on Animal Rights. They've got the best guitar solos, they actually change up the dynamics a bit instead of just blasting it throughout, and there's some synth parts mixed in, making it kind of reminiscent of Radiohead, but with a little more metal influence. So if Moby put a little more thought into these songs, wasn't so obsessed with playing super fast, though it's only super fast by his usual standards really, and bothered to record someone playing a live drum kit, it, then Animal Rights could have been a far more consistent album instead of just showing potential on a couple of tracks. Some of those tracks sound like Moby had listened to punk albums for the first time before making this album, which was far from the case. It's a very misguided album, and while it probably isn't the flaming hot garbage that many people treat it as, its commercial failure is pretty understandable. It didn't matter too much in the end though, because his next album, Play, went on to sell only about 12 million copies and establish him as an electronic superstar who would go on to become one of Slim Shady's numerous celebrity targets. And of course, Date Lion Del Rey and Natalie Portman. Never forget that. Never forget. To answer the ultimate question posed by this video, can Moby rock? My answer is yes, because the ability is undoubtedly there, even if Animal Rights didn't exactly make the best use of those abilities much of the time. But also the album's really not that bad. Now, in terms of other non-rock artists making rock albums that I could feature in this Can They Rock series, I have a few more artists in mind, but if any albums immediately jump out at you that fit this description, then do suggest them below. Hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope that you'll stick around for the next time that I upload, whenever that may be. See ya. Crash!